Dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of BB Biotech and Bellevue Asset Management, I would like to welcome you to our WebEx call update, BB Biotech. Today, March 31st, 2020. My name is Patrick Fishley, and I will lead you through this call. The last few weeks have been a great challenge for all of us, both privately and professionally. The turmoil on the financial markets in particular is making life difficult for investors. But it is precisely here where you need to have a long-term view and a steady investment philosophy. With over 25 years of investment experience in biotechnology, a team of six investment specialists and five famous board members, we at BB Biotech have an immense wealth of experience. Our aim today is to show you how we, as portfolio manager of BB Biotech, have acted in, the, in this phase, what our assessments are, and where we see opportunities. This call will take about 30 minutes. You are welcome to ask questions via the chat directly uh, here in the call or to your advisor afterwards. If you do not see the presentation right now on your screen, please send an informal email to my colleague, Tanya Frey. Her email address is tfr at bellevue.ch, tango, foxtrot, romeo at bellevue.ch, and she will send you the presentation by mail. As usual, we will record the call, this call and send it to all participants, including the presentation. You will also find this record and all our assessments on the healthcare and especially on the biotech market very prominently on the first page of our homepage. I'm very pleased to have here today Dr. Daniel Koller. He's been the successful head of BB Biotech AG for more than 10 years. He knows the markets and its developments by heart. Daniel, how are you dealing with the current situation? Yeah. Thanks, Patrick, for the intro and for, I would say, a big question, at least these days. Um, allow me, though, nevertheless, to, uh, before going to the COVID-19 uh, situation and our analysis and uh, investment approach, in this context to very quickly run you through the general part of the slide deck. Um, if you don't mind to flip on page uh, three, you see there the agenda. So a couple of slides on the team and facts and figures on BB Biotech, then what's going on in the industry before then moving over to an investment um, in innovation that we headline under the agenda item number three. And there I would already explain your outline the first examples that has a direct implication with COVID-19, that's Moderna, before then moving over to the overall investment strategy and what COVID-19 has meant so far for us and how do we judge it, as well as to close it out with a quick outlook regarding 2020. Quick summary to the facts, you see on page uh, five, uh, the, the key figures and facts about BB Biotech, as said, uh, initiated or launched in 1993. You see here all, uh, all the information that we want to highlight as well in figures. Let me just, in the context of the AGM that just happened a couple of days ago, that uh, the dividend payout of three Swiss francs 40 have been paid out. Um, this was an average 5% dividend yield of the average December share price. And given, as I said, the sell-off we have seen in broad markets, even in BB Biotech the last couple of weeks, uh, this was rather now 7.5%, almost 8% yield at the moment of payout. And the second part, and apologies there, seems to be something wrong with, at least on my deck, uh, with uh, Professor Thompson, um, that you see on the very right-hand side, or potentially don't see, but we will, uh, we will make sure that works out. Uh, we had two new board members elected as well um, at this year's AGM. Uh, Susan Galbright, which is very well known um, in the UK and uh, being uh, the representative of AstraZeneca, who leads the head of oncology research and early development. And I said, Mats Thompson, who for many, many years now um, is the CSO of Novo Nordisk and obviously brings an enormous wealth of 
know-how and experience as well. To the other three board members that have been re-elected, uh, all of you know Eric Hunziker as the, our chairman for many years, Clive Meanwell and Thomas von Planta. I said that stand all for re-election on a yearly basis as such. On the team side, nothing has changed. So allow me in the, in the context of time um, to skip this. I think that's good news that the team is together for a very long time, very stable. Uh, this will help us as well in times uh, when it's not so easy and uh, to reflect on uh, what we best do and stay fundamental and true to our investment hypothesis. On the performance side, just quickly, the one year and three year, um, we are obviously not satisfied with that, uh, roughly 10% behind the benchmark. On the one year basis, you see there as well how this fluctuates. So we think this is a lot of it is short term and a lot of it is noise and volatility these days. Uh, but I think it's typical, as I said, that the last couple of weeks have been uh, rougher for us in the context of having a large exposure to the smaller and mostly mid-cap space, whereas, as I said, the large caps, although selling off to some degree, uh, they have now been the first beneficiary of uh, the rebound that we see uh, mostly happening, at least in our space, in, in the larger cap universe. And nevertheless, we stick to what, as I said, we see as a very fundamental approach to invest into innovation. Because what you see on the next slide, then, um, that's uh, slide number uh, nine. Uh, on the long term chart, that's what we think we can achieve as well into the future A, uh, that we can achieve our double digit returns on a compound basis. Our return on investment goal is 15%. So, given now, I said the last sell off, we are somewhat behind that. But you see here as well, I said that the strategy over the mid and long term has paid off uh, quite uh, well, even both or both actually on an absolute and on a relative basis. And we think we have all the means uh, to continue this track or this track record on a forward basis. Just very quickly on the biotech industry, um, the growth drivers, I mean, the main driver there is still um, the aging population, nothing new. On the right hand side, you see there uh, actually the log incidence uh, chart that you have to read in reverse, meaning um, the higher it goes there on, on the on the Y scale, the more prominent the disease is uh, linked to age. I think that will remain one of the key drivers and see there at the bottom part, top right, uh, bottom right, actually, which one of the disease areas um, are here of importance because you will see many of them then in the future context or in the context of our um, investment allocation per se. Then productivity remains, uh, I think, very good. We had 48 approvals last year, slightly shy of the record that we have seen in 2018, but 20 plus approvals just in the last quarter of 2019. And in this context, although right now, many of the meetings, even with regulators, go virtual, um, we think, as I said, FDA can continue to act and has already done so and will continue to do so over the year. And this is, the basis for what you see on the second bullet, actually that the industry has said on a compound basis grows quite nicely. It looks like a little bit of a wave function here uh, or a wavish curve as such, but nevertheless on a compound basis, we see a high single digit to low teens uh, percentage in terms of industry revenue growth on a compound basis. And last but not least, um, that's another point we have seen in substantial increase in dollars that went into a merchant acquisition or takeovers in 2019. This was driven as well because some large cap transaction happened because you see there as well on the absolute level, the deal in numbers have come or has come off somewhat. For 2020 now, it has started rather quiet and probably will stay quiet for these weeks. But as soon as the volatility um, gets smaller or abates, we assume actually that both the licensing and M&A activity will substantially ramp up uh, given where the industry stands in its cycle. And last but not least, um, the long-term uh, trajectory of the industry in terms of, of earnings power, you see there a similar wave function because some of the large caps have disappeared because of M&A. Um, a Gilead has gone uh, very strong in terms of profitability with its Hep C launch now shrunk quite a bit again. But the good news for us is that the future years are more and more built as well because we have an increasing number of mid caps that have turned sust or sustainable profitable. So we think actually the Ford assumptions will, um, will actually increase um, in, in quality as well over time. 
And with that, allow me to quickly run through investment process and much more importantly through one or the other example. Um, on the following slide where you see the investment process in summary described, that just quickly we have a broad universe of 1,000 plus minus listed and late stage private equity companies. I'm talking about page number 15 now. And for us, with an extensive due diligence um, um, approach, we break this down into a concentrated portfolio of a minimum 20, maximum 35 holdings. And allow me now as well, the next two slides to outline where and in what kind of technology invest, where or within which disease areas you see on slide 16 on the left-hand side, cancer is still a core area, orphan drug, central nervous system disorder, cardiovascular metabolic syndrome. So just thinking of COVID-19, you see here a lack of, for example, antivirals mentioned. We still have some of that exposure, but I will touch on this later on. And then the technologies on the next page, on page 17, um, everybody knows the pills, the short-acting drugs versus the long or the mid- and long-term-acting drugs, such as biologics, RNA-based therapies, and then the once-in-a-lifetime or once-per-year treatment like cell-based gene therapy and genome editing, which I will highlight in a couple of examples to come. But let me start just very quickly with an Example, I think that uh, has gone extremely well for the investors of BB Biotech, and we think has, has a very solid footing even in the face of a crisis or now at least into a partial lockdown and pandemic situation. And that's Vertex, who has developed into the world leading cystic fibrosis company. You see on the left hand side on this slide, number 18. Actually, the cell or an, an epidermal cell of the lung, where at the top left you see the CFTR, that's actually an, an ion channel, a protein that has the function in, or that's actually dysfunctional in cystic fibrosis patients. You see on the right hand side, Vertex has already three approved products out there. Kaleidico first, or can be with its follow on molecule, and then most importantly, um, in late third quarter, beginning of fourth quarter of last year, they launched Trikafta, which is a triple combination, which I'm going to introduce you on the next slide. That's page 19. Look at the chart quickly there on the left-hand side. Uh, you see there actually the long function data on a shorter term um, trial, but this was uh, actually the data that led to the approval of the drug in gray, the bullets below that go along the flat line or slightly negative is actually control arm, meaning no activity or um, no effect. And then a very steep gain, even though only treated for two weeks, um, that patients have 10 plus percentage gains, points in forced vital capacity readouts. Patients have to take these drugs or try CAFTA on a daily basis, on a chronic basis, so they cannot stop in this environment. And that's the base as well uh, for what you see on the next slide on page 20. As I said, these molecules are the only option for cystic fibrosis patients actually to have a better quality of life and actually, I would say, almost a cure or cure-like uh, situation. And you see there the steep ramp from 500 million revenues in 2014 to around 4 billion plus in 2019. And we think Vertex has all the means actually to grow through whatever is going on right now, because I said they can deliver these uh, these drugs per per mail delivery. They know pretty much every single patient. They have special pharmacies that are responsible for distribution. So, um, and all our discussion with the company lead us uh, to believe that I said they are stockpiled. Uh, they have well prepared for all of this, or they are always well prepared for all of this. So we think Vertex is here on a good trajectory. I said to reach peak sales potential somewhere between eight and ten billion and will continue to be one of the very successful uh, larger cap high growth biotech companies. And with that over to the RNA based medicines, uh, that makes up around a quarter of our portfolio. You see the five names at the bottom left. Uh, we historically have spoken mostly about um, the antisense and SI RNA companies, but in the context of COVID-19, let me take another example that's actually Moderna which we add to our portfolio in the first quarter of 2018. They work on mRNA-based medicines. And you see at the bottom part of that slide, actually uh, the cartoon, how this works. The DNA is our genetic storage uh, form. And this has to translate into function. And how it's done is by the means of messenger RNA, which is translated into nuclei of every cell. 
transported inside the plasma of a cell and they're actually translated into function, into proteins. And why is this of importance, at least in the context of now this COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Because actually Moderna was and is by far the fastest company and we think the best one to line up to have a potential prophylactic vaccine ready by the fourth quarter of this year if everything goes well. The reason why they're able to do so is because this technology allows them to be extremely efficient. And you see this at the bottom part. Um, when they had the first sequence of the virus identified, they optimized uh, the algorithm in-house to find the best so-called messenger RNAs that represent the virus coding proteins for or the surface proteins that then lead to an immune response. And within a three, four weeks time horizon post that, actually at day 40, 42, they had the first clinical candidate ready that uh, actually two weeks ago now started trials in healthy volunteer. We expect initial uh, clinical data to come in early summer latest, then have uh, broadening into a larger patient population to better understand the safety profile on top. And I said, if the FDA allows them to launch at risk, or at least for special population or at risk population, like healthcare workers, like elderly, et cetera, um, Moderna actually has the capacity to ramp up to 100 million doses by the end of this year, which means around 50 million people would have access uh, to a potential um, prophylactic vaccine. Why are we optimistic? Although we think economically it's not the most important project of uh, Moderna, but why are we optimistic? Because the company over the last couple of years actually has worked efficiently on many other prophylactic vaccines. And you see here a couple of examples on at the next slide. That's slide number uh, 24. There you see, for example, uh, CMV, so cytomegalovirus, RSV, a respiratory syncytial virus, Zika, which we all have heard about a year or two years ago. These are all candidates where the company already has shown a solid proof of concept actually in hundreds, I would say cumulative already to thousands of patients that have elected very good antibody responses and, and a good safety profile as such. With that, to close it out, two newer technologies, or I would say more frontier uh, technologies. One is gene therapy. We had the last company of ours in an acquisition taken over in the fourth quarter of last year. This was Odentis, which was taken over uh, by 3 billion. We have three more companies in the portfolio who work on the gene therapy field. Um, here is Sangamo as an example, who delivers or has uh, generated data for a one-time delivery for hemophilia A patients. That program right now is in a registration trial with its development partner, Pfizer. And I said, you see there at the bottom left part, for example, how I said the factor eight level, the recombinant level in the plasma or in the blood of a patient have gone up. Steadily on the right hand side, almost more important in the light bluish part, the high dose patients or patients who received a single high dose of this gene therapy, they've actually pretty much achieved levels that they don't have to take any recombinant factor eight anymore and they can avoid uh, bleeding episodes uh, to a level of 100% reduction as such. And last but not least, I would say even more down the road in terms of frontier, uh, in terms of technology or genome editing approaches. Here we outline CRISPR therapeutics, where we expect the further clinical data in beta cell and sickle cell by the end of this year that potentially lead then to registrational approaches in, in 2021. Um, and you see here an example I said uh, in, in this chart that outlines how the company achieves here um, high levels actually of functional hemoglobin that would lead to um, cures uh, for these patients. With that, quickly over to the investment strategy before then moving over said to a special section which we called COVID-19. You all know this chart if you have cross path with BB Biotech because we show it for pretty much since inception what you see on page 28. Uh, we continue this uh, investment cycle to invest into small mids that we think have the best potential. We have to have a certain um, a long term view and um, breadth and um, to actually have these investments go and evolve over this S curve all the way to reach then uh, product approvals, revenues and profits. And if they turn into large caps, lower growth companies, we would 
obviously take profits and then recycle the capital back into the next generation idea. The goal here, I said, is return on investment targets of 15% per annum as such. And how have we done so in terms of technology that we have talked a lot? Um, you see here the real time evolution of BB Biotech's investment into different technologies. On many of these technologies, we have been early on, and I would say very successful. And then on the right-hand side, you see the four investments we have done throughout 2019. CRISPR therapeutics, obviously, in the genome editing field, homology, both in gene therapy and genome editing. And then molecular template and the RENOS, which work on different technologies in the oncology field. And you see for each of these companies a brief description page, actually, in the appendix. The portfolio... On the next slide, still reflects that we run a concentrated uh, approach with, as I said, the top 10 holdings making up around two thirds of the portfolio. And you see what's very typical for us, um, the new position somewhere between half a percent and two percent. And then they're off to the races um, to prove that they hit their milestones, uh, that we have done the right or we have had the right call in terms of valuation and that these companies then grow in the portfolio by performance in the stock market. And if you look at the breakdown on the next slide or the last slide regarding the page 31, on the left-hand side, you see the different disease areas. I said Orphan now is uh, the largest part followed by oncology and neuro. In the middle, you see a 100% US dollar denomination. Um, that includes the one European company, Argenix, we are invested in because we buy the ADR. And then on the right-hand side, I said 80% of the investments are actually in, I would say, the mid-caps from the smaller end to the larger end. Um, so somewhere between 1 and 30 billion, that's actually where I said the core of our investment strategy resides and where we think, I said, uh, in the mid and long term, we have all the opportunities uh, to perform. Um, with that, allow me to then move over to, as I said, one of the key topics um, of today's presentation, COVID-19. Uh, three, four slides on this. The first one is actually what has happened in stock markets. You see there on the left-hand side, the year started calm, although in China we had already the spread of COVID-19, but the Western world and Western economies and Western stock markets ignored that for a long time up until actually in February, when in Italy, uh, or the spread started in Europe, and globally, Italy went into lockdowns, and people started to reflect on the potential risk for, for the economies as such. And then came, I would say, pandemonia in terms of, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks from the OPEC uh, killing uh, its, its deal in terms of crude pricing. So we saw suddenly, for example, crude drop 30% in a day, Volatilities go sky high, uh, the fear factor going up. And in recent days, we have seen uh, calmer levels because uh, people start to reflect what it means, how these curves look like. And as I said, there are prediction now that within the next couple of weeks, we see in many, at least European countries, a peak. That doesn't mean we are through, but at least the peak effects are through and then society has to reflect on how to continue. How this looks is what you see on the next page. And this is, for example, I I cut and it purposely didn't update this. So you see how quickly I said this evolution goes. So this was the March 20th time point, 380,000 um, proven cases, 16,000 deaths and 100,000 recoveries. As of this morning, I've seen we are getting close to 800,000 cases. Um, almost 38,000 people died on a global scale. And I said the recovery rate is still rather low at 165,000. That's as well because said the virus takes quite some time uh, to be cured off. And we mentioned here it's not a flu. It's much more severe than a flu. Um, that's clear. Um, and one of the main reasons is because said the population has no historic immunity. And so what can we do as a healthcare system? And you obviously heard this a lot, um, all the measures in terms of social distancing, trying to uh, stop the spread. But what can the healthcare industry do? mainly do, and I think next to the hospital and, 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 and the nurses and, and the physicians. I think these are two points. One is the diagnostics part in terms of better understanding the spread and the dispersion and how to keep track of what's going on and how to best react. And then the bullet number two, which, is, which our industry plays a big part, actually, I said, to find drugs or test drugs that 
work on different levels. That's what you see on the next slide there. So we have the so-called antiviral or the direct antivirals that mostly will be used for patients that have A, an acute infection and B, have moderate to severe symptoms. Because if you have moderate symptoms or hardly any symptoms, you would never take these drugs because they have quite a lot of side effects or some of them are intravenous. We hear a lot about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. I said these are two old anti-malaria drugs with mixed data sets, some data proof that I said it has a small benefit in terms of faster cure and virus clearance rates and uh, that p patients can leave the hospital quicker. Others have shown hardly any benefit at all. And the big data point the industry is waiting for is actually remdesivir from Gilead in that respect. I said Chinese data are due any day. The question is how good are they stratified and how of what quality are they? And then Gilead outlined that they're going to have U.S. randomized trials. I said probably rather in the May time frame um, that then gives the real answer as well. When do you have to treat patients? Probably rather early than late in the cycle. Then we have strategies like neutralizing antibodies um, or RNA blockade um, in terms of uh, the virus cycle and, and replication. And then the second bullet are actually drugs that are already in the market, like Actemra or Kefsara. These are drugs from Roche, uh, Sanofi, and Regeneron, which you don't use to treat actually the virus, but you treat the side effect of the virus because the immune system runs havoc in the lungs of some of these severe patients. And you want to down tune actually the immune system um, I said to stop uh, damaging the lungs at the higher level. And that's why I give a set uh, these IL-6 antagonists from these two drugs. And then most importantly, because our base assumption is I said the virus will peak in some weeks to come. The virus though will probably not disappear entirely, but will resurface back in fall or, or in winter time. And for that, I said to be pre better prepared for the wave two or potentially even a wave three we need prophylactic vaccines. And I have touched on a couple of slides before on the so-called mRNA-based vaccines. We think Moderna's, they're clearly in the lead. We have three nowadays, four other companies, BioNTech, CureVac, and Transition Bio as well, that are in the race. We see plasmid-based approaches. And then we have the so-called recombinant classical vaccines, where just yesterday we heard from J&J &J that it will take some time, but they're actually willing uh, to prepare and sell uh, this, this vaccine pretty much at cost. And that's an important bullet I mentioned there, slightly smaller written, but we think, as I said, many of these projects are very important and interesting, but we have to be very careful as investors um, not to chase their uh, momentum and noise, because I said some of these projects are, you know, very early on, a lot of promise, uh, sometimes not even resolved in terms of capacity, how they will run up, nor in the end how they're going to make money or how they're going to drive an NPV out of these projects. But I think the last bullet there in grey is very important. We think, as I said, the industry has a perfect chance to be a big part of the solution of this crisis. Um, and if that happens, uh, we think as well that, as I said, the public opinion can change drastically uh, to the upside or to the positive. And last but not least, what does it mean to our portfolio? I said Moderna is obviously part potential in terms of what it all means for their business model and their vaccine business as such. But we have to see as well from the risk side. And we mentioned here a couple of bullets that we have actively addressed even multiple times with the portfolio companies over the last couple of weeks. A, what are their revenue and profit outlook? We want to make sure as that company can weather, um, you know, their business cases uh, throughout even lockdowns. Uh, for the drug development companies or the earlier clinical stage companies, you mostly look into how strong their balance sheets are because Wall Street be closed, at least to raise capital. And then last but not least, the bullet that we have to very carefully measure, and that will depend a lot how long these lockdowns are stopped stoppages are ongoing, is what are the implications for ongoing clinical trials, as well as for future clinical trials. We have said right now, some of the early stage approaches now being put on hold because people just rather want to wait it out for three months to see how this all um, actually goes by. And with that to the outlook, um, 
two slides to close it out. We have, as I said, a lot of milestones for 2020. Uh, we think, as I said, implication on a short-term basis are very limited on that front because most of what you see there, for example, data readouts that we expect for 2020 are independent of what's going on right now. Many of these trials have fully enrolled, and we just wait actually for the final data points, like, for example, Carbometrics from Exelixis or Mavacampton from Myocardia or Argenix 113 from Argenix. All these trials will read out in the second quarter. Or think of, for example, an Ionis Roche collaboration in Huntington's disease. And these patients are in a deadly disease. They have no alternative. We are highly convinced they still will continue to go actually to a hospital setting and take these drugs. Product approvals, the same. FDA has already approved products, even though almost on a virtual basis. Um, you see there Esperion with two products approved. They just announced yesterday they're going to launch this even in this environment because they think and, and they have the understanding for clear demand. And we have multiple other important products to come throughout 2020. And then last but not least, I touched on this quickly. We had so far, I would say, licensing deals only in the portfolio. But we think, as I said, if um, actually volatility is going to abate or gets normalized, that we're going to see new levels and valuation levels are so low that I think some of these BD deals rather turn into m and or at least the companies are at risk. And that's the handover to the last slide for me. With the portfolio, we have been convinced early in the year that I said the portfolio was very attractively valued prior to the correction. We have seen now corrections uh, in some of the names of 10, 20, sometimes even 30, 40, 50 percent. So we think they're actually now even more attractive as long as they have all the means to make it well uh, through throughout, uh, as I said, this pandemic, at least so far, short-term crisis, and we're convinced they do so. Um, then we have a portfolio that offers access to leading technologies in, in its trucks. Some of them are hopefully as well solutions to the current crisis. And as I said, the COVID-19 crisis we see much more as actually a positive for the industry in terms of public opinion rather than NPV meaning being part of the solution will potentially impact as well how healthcare reforms in the future will look like and how the industry is seen. Then second bullet is the board and the team. We could strengthen the board of directors. We think we have a very experienced team. We have gone through multiple uh, historic uh, stock market, let's say, crisis or economical crisis and always came out stronger. We stick to our fundamental analysis and established investment approach. So we do not going to chase short-term momentum names now in this COVID-19 craze where I said a lot of companies are busy pushing out press releases on an almost daily basis. And we have a high conviction actually in our portfolio to have, I said, a lot of mid and long-term upside potential. I said, not being part of the short-term rebound, we see this now even overstretched on top. And last but not least, this is more a policy from BB Biotech, which is special that we pay out the dividend, which is unusual in the biotech industry. And you see a quote from our chairman uh, that he has given at, I said, last week's AGM or two weeks ago, that I said this, this dividend policy will absolutely continue for uh, the coming years and we uh, will plan for this. With that, I thank you very much for your attention and we shall see. I don't know if there are now questions uh, now or if you're going to address them later on on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But thanks a lot again for listening and for taking part in this call. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we received uh, just one question, which we might uh, answer directly afterwards. Um, we received also some feedbacks that uh, pictures and tone are not correct. We apologize for this, but in these days, um, technique is not as uh, as good as it should be. Um, Danny, can we shall we answer it later on? Yes, this question we can good. directly answer later on. Okay. Um, I want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being part of this uh, call. I think it's very important. Uh, to have page 35 with regard to vaccine and, and drug candidates, but even more important is page 36 with all the milestones. 
And uh, I think it's very key for all of you as an investor that you, you do not take the uh, decision only on based on, on uh, new development of a vaccine of corona, but that you are aware that many biotech companies are developing also successful drugs in other areas, cancer, cardiovascular, neurological diseases. And these are the areas where, uh, where a biotech industry will uh, grow fast in the next future. Therefore, thank you very much for your uh, participation and hope to hear soon. Best regards.